Smart businesses use data science for growth. Do you know how? Mind Your Data is a podcast that explores how business owners, entrepreneurs, and managers can understand how to be more data-driven. And once you know how, you can use that data science to increase profits, reduce costs, and boost productivity. And now here's the host of Mind Your Data, Kranti Panam. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our show today. Very excited about our episode. We're going to be talking to Andrew Augustiniak, who's from a mortgage industry. More importantly, for our listeners who don't know, Andrew is, my, Andrew is a neighbor to VJ, who's actually my business partner and a really close friend. He Andrew is involved in many ventures, which we would like to touch upon. And in particular, we'd like to talk about his podcast that he co-hosts. It's called Fueled by Vi Podcast. Uh, and I strongly recommend everyone to check it out. It's, it's pretty cool. I actually heard a few episodes, so I'm a big fan already. So with no further ado, can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and we'll get the show started? Yeah, for sure. And thanks for having me on. I'm super excited. A um, little bit about, about myself. <clears throat> Grew up in Arizona, um, played golf my whole life, essentially got a golf scholarship to University of Nevada, Reno, um, mm-hmm. moved over to, to Reno, uh, which if everybody knows VJ, Boise State, University of Nevada, Reno, going at it, but we took down Boise State that one year. Um, That's cool. But, uh, lived in Reno for two years, made me a pre- moving from Arizona to cold weather was quite a change. And it made me realize that I don't want to live in cold weather. Um, so I went to college there, played golf there, um, graduated with just a normal business degree and, mm-hmm. uh, and then turned professional in 2012 uh, golf wise. Hard, very tough, very tough life. Um, tried doing that. If ever, anybody knows minor league sports, it's a it's a struggle. Um, mm-hmm. You're you're eating PB and J's, and I I was a CrossFit trainer. I'd play golf during the days, and then I'd wait tables at night, and it was a grind because you're chasing the dream, right? You want to be a professional golfer, and uh, mm-hmm. year and a half in, I was just too stressed. It it wasn't it wasn't enjoyable enjoyable anymore um plus 2012 was not not a time where people were giving minor league athletes money you know that's where the uh, the economy is just starting that little that little dip up um and so it was just not financially a great time and a year and a half in i saw individuals who were 20 years older than me had nothing to their name because they were still holding on to this dream without coming to reality Mm -hmm. so a year and a half in I was just like, that's not the life I want to live. And the co-owner of my CrossFit gym, I was a trainer at, we're talking in the morning and you know, the saying that like, it's not what you know, it's who, who, you know, Mm -hmm. um, I am, I am a thousand percent a believer in that statement. Um, because networking is everything. And yeah, it's a little bit of what, you know, obviously, and being a specialist in your field, but like every opportunity that you have in life is from meeting somebody. And um, we were talking that morning and at the CrossFit gym, it's 5.30 a.m. I'm about to coach a class and I'm like, I can't do this golf thing anymore. And he had been in mortgage for 10 years and he's like, you should be a mortgage guy. And I'm like, what? I don't even know what that is. And he goes, yeah, like think, he goes, I've been in mortgage for 10 years. He goes, you talk, you like talking to people, you teach these classes with people, you wait tables, customer service, time management. And he goes, um, and you're a golfer. Realtors love to golf. And mm-hmm. I said, okay. He goes, Hey, if you get your license, like you can come work, work for me. And I don't think he was serious, but I took it seriously. So that, that night I signed up for my mortgage license and I came back in the morning and I said, well, I signed up like, do you have a job for me? And he, and I saw him, his face go like, Oh, Oh crap. Like I didn't, I wasn't serious. I didn't think you were going to do it, but that's me. Like, like I'm going to, I'm going to jump at every opportunity. Um, Mm -hmm. and I did, and I got licensed and I became his assistant and I didn't touch a golf club for three years because I had this new opportunity that I was just like, I'm going to go all in on. And now, now I play golf. I got back into golf after a couple of years of this, like building that business, like now my kids are all in golf and all that stuff. So golf is a big passion of mine again. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but I, I got into mortgage and, and slowly realized like most people in most industries are like having a work ethic and working hard is, is, is not a trade everybody has. And I realized that in mortgage very fast and, um, within a year started my own team. So I worked for that guy for a year in mortgage, started my own team. Um, and by my third year, I became top 1% of the nation for mortgage lenders. Um, That's crazy. and built a team just off simple concepts. I believe business is simple and, you know, you just, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You just need to make it roll faster. And I took that principle to heart. And I just, man, I, I remember that first five years of mortgage of trying to meet every single person possible and emailing 200 people a day to try and get three coffee meetings and just put more people in the funnel. Um, mm -hmm. And that kind of goes back to my philosophy of like, I will throw spaghetti at a wall and see if it sticks as much as I can and meet as many people as I can, because you just never know what next relationship is going to lead to, to something else, you know? Um, and now fast forward, I've been in mortgage for 10 years that, that, that kind of set the, the foundation for my life and career. And then started a bunch of different ventures, you know, from there, uh, started investing in real estate within a year of starting mortgage. Um, so me and my wife manage a bunch of rental properties, started a podcast seven years ago, which that's kind of, that passion is kind of, I put a lot more time into that this year and really growing that into a true business. Um, I partners in a company called putt tech. So now, and there's a, a few other things that we're working on, you know, we're constantly trying, trying new things. Cause at the end of the day, like you just have to, it's like investing, right? You got to have fill mm -hmm. different buckets and balance and hedge each other and have, have diversify your investments and for business and what brings in money for um, myself and my family. Like I'm big on diversifying and trying a bunch of new things cut because you never know what the next thing is going to be in your life that, that brings joy and happiness. Cause obviously burnout is real. Um, but yeah, so now I'm, now this is my 11th year in mortgage and doing a bunch of other stuff and still have our branch. My branch runs and still producing a ton on, on the mortgage. That's always going to be the bread and butter, but now doing a bunch of other, other small ventures to see what I can make into something. That's crazy. A um, lot to unpack and <laughs> really, you know, I'm, I'm blown away with, you know, how you started to where you are today. And I, with, when you think about time as a perspective, 10 years, is not a long time. But when you think about it, you've done so much from the point that you were at 5.30 a.m. Um, talk to where you are today. When you look back, and I'm sure you you probably feel proud of where, where that's kind of gotten and how that went about. So I'd love to kind of pick a few things, especially with my background from business. And, you know, when you talked about a couple different important things that you've noticed that most people don't have uh, to be successful in a business. When you first started, when you first kind of started in the mortgage industry, you know, you, you probably were brand new when, when you came out after a year to do your own thing. What were the key things that you've noticed that really differentiated you to spiral you to the top 1%? Yeah, that man, that is a great question. Cause I think this applies to every business. Mm -hmm. Um, first and foremost, I, I noticed laziness and it's, it's crazy how much people in every industry don't take the little bit of time that could bring them so much more business. And, and a great example would be in, in my industry, we're big on referrals, right? You have, you have a few different aspects and I'm sure most business are, have the the call centers, the online companies who generate a lot of leads. And then you have the, the referral base. Mm -hmm. um, most successful mortgage people for the most part are referral aside from the rockets, the big, big banks. But one great example would be when you have this one client and you close a deal, most mortgage people, boom, they close the deal, they get paid, they move on to the next one. Right. And what I found, I looked and I'm like, guys, that one refer that one client is worth a hundred more referrals. Let's not right. move on to the next one. Let's make sure you're exhausting and, and continuing to develop that relationship 
from that one referral. You've already done a great job for closing them, but you can't, mm -hmm. you can't expect that they're going to give you a referral. You still have to earn the referral. And this is where most people close the deal and they stop. And it's like, no, you have to keep going. You have to earn it. You have to motivate them to want to refer you. And what I find is most people just expect to get the referral, but they you have to motivate somebody to want to refer you to somebody else. And so what I started doing very early was just trying to go above and beyond was it was going to actually the signings. Like most people don't want to go to their client signing. I'd go to the signings early on. I go to every signing to be there with them, holding their hand. I would try to throw them housewarming parties to because what's the easiest way to meet all their friends? Yeah. Throwing them a housewarming party. 99% 99 of people don't throw, mortgage people don't throw their housewarming party, especially a loan officer from Wells Fargo Bank is not going to throw them a housewarming party. But that's how, that's how you, A, keep them motivated to want to refer you. But B, mm -hmm. um, that's how you meet all their potential referrals, all their friends. And so we did that a lot. Now, nowadays, it's a little different after COVID and everything like that. So it's starting to come back and I'm starting to, starting to push that more again. Um, but early on, that was a big factor. Um, doing quarterly uh, events, I, I rent out movie theaters and bang for your buck, treat 200 clients, tell them to bring friends every quarter. What family doesn't want to go take their kids to an afternoon movie? And so like, those little things, calling yeah. your clients maybe six months later and just checking in on them. You have to earn that referral. And that's where that's the perfect example of, of little things that people don't take that extra couple steps to try and gain more business. We That's what I recognized early on. And just like, man, there's a great opportunity. Don't just move on to the next deal. Keep nurturing that that one relationship to try and get more referrals from them. Yeah, great. I mean, and the points that you just mentioned are when you think about it, right? They're so fundamental to any business, right? Saying you and it doesn't matter which business you are, you could have many sales channels that you get your sales in, but referrals are probably your best sales channels. And really motivating the concept of actually motivating your customer to refer, I think is so powerful. And it goes to show that you're actually creating lifelong relationships. And I heard this from Tony Robbins many years ago. You have to create raving fan customers, not just regular customers. So people actually rave about you when they talk of, about you. So I'm sure what you are saying is so fundamental, but I'm sure 99% don't do it. And that's why you're in the top 1%. Congratulations again, man. And the one other thing that I want to talk about, especially with our podcast and the emphasis on data and how you use it, right? You said when you first started and the number of phone conversations, did you see any kind of particular trends that these were the steps that you needed to do, or this is the amount of information I need to collect? So make 200 phone calls to get two referrals, right? Two meetings, yeah. that sort of thing. Did you kind of look at that? Did you measure that? Was there any kind of mechanism that you went through? Yeah, data. Oh man, data is key. Data, data in our industry, especially with mortgage, with rates, with real estate selling versus buying. Where are your referrals coming from? Um, I'm always tracking what what's bringing the most success at a certain time, and that changes throughout different different time periods. For example, in yeah. 2020 and 21, that was refi city, and that was buyer city. And mm -hmm. during that time, well, it's crazy is, you know, from 2013 to 2019, the majority of referrals would come from real estate agents because the client would refer the real estate agent, the real estate agent would refer them back to us as the lender. And that's where the, and so you would, what we would do is we'd focus more on developing real, realtor relationships, telling, teaching them how to do house room parties so we can partner with them. Right. And then in 2020, 21, where rates hit rock bottom, people were refinancing, pulling cash out, buying more property, all this stuff. But what I found is more of my referrals were coming from past clients. So you have to, you have to alter. And I started going more heavy on, on even heavier on developing that relationship with the past clients, staying in front of them 
because I found more people were, because so many people were getting into the market, refinancing, all that stuff, they were asking their friends, hey, who's the lender you use? Who's the lender? So during that, that last two and a half years, it was like, no, be top of mind with your clients because the data, my data is showing me like most of my referrals are coming from clients now. So you got to stop and, and alter. Okay, more there. Now it's slowed down. Rates are up. We're back into us back to real to referrals a lot of time because it's not as crazy. So now we have to alter our mindset and go back to kind of what I did in 2013 and 19 of developing real realtor relationships and going back to you know emailing, texting, calling them to drive to simply hey let's go grab coffee meetings or stuff like that. And at that time or at that time it was yeah it was like I know for every hundred emails, I'd probably get two to three yeses. And so you just, it's a numbers game, put more in the funnel. The more people you contact in the funnel, the more you come out. Mm -hmm. And then as that grows, your referral tree grows more. So it's this constant game of, okay, where, what's, what's going on in the market and how does that, ref, how does that reflect on where my referrals are coming from? And you have to constantly be on there because if in 2020 and 2021, I didn't alter that and I didn't go refi heavy, client heavy, I wouldn't have 2020 and 2021 21 were record years. And so yeah. like, but I know, I know a lot of loan officers who, who were like, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to focus on refi business and past clients. It's purchased from refi or realtors and, and all that stuff. And it's like, no, you got to strike while the iron's hot. You got to adjust with the market to to take your opportunity to increase your opportunity level and those people didn't have record years because they wanted to keep with what was the trends from 2013 to 2019 but now we're going back to that which is fine but data our our industry is so data driven simply because of interest rates alone but yeah. constantly focusing on that will will dictate how how I want to go about it who I want to approach and at the same time, you still have to have your foundation of like just constantly networking, constantly doing all those things, but just adjusting where you allocate your time. I think that's where the data data means the most to me. And you know, great point in terms of how you make adjustments on which season your business is in. I mean, if it is not the right time to be doing a certain sales motion, it won't give you the result that you're looking for. And I think Fundamentally, I think going back to the key takeaway is really understanding the information to make those informed decisions. And I think you've done that to a very high level of success. That's great. You think, um, go ahead. I was going to say, think about it this way for for the real estate investing side. And, and I know you, you, you look at this right now, data shows there's way less buyers in the market mm -hmm. simply because of interest rates, right? You have a lot of fear. Yeah. Well, when the data shows us that there's less, le way less buyers on the real estate investing side, that shows that there's greater opportunity for sure. for investors like you and myself and our client and my clients who are investors, because now you know there's deals to be had. Values have gone down because you have don't have people bidding up houses like crazy. Because yeah. um, at the end of the day, if you rationalize and say, okay, data shows there's way less buyers, sales are down that's a better opportunity for buyers to negotiate deals, interest rates will always go up and down. And that's yeah. how you, that in reality, like you don't look at that when you're looking at buying. Although a lot of people use that as a, as fear to not buy. But if you know that interest rates will always go up and down, you have to buy when the opportunity is there because the minute interest rates go down, everybody's going to go flood back in and values are going to jump again. No, great point. And yeah, and that's why we just closed on a deal yesterday, which is, um, we, we buy multifamily apartments and everyone's around us asking, Hey, why are you buying now? This is not the right time, but you know, it really becomes a factor of how confident you are, what your hold times are and what, you know, what your underwriting model looks like. Yeah. When you start doing, making these decisions and it comes down to using the data that you have over the years to make these decisions. These are all trends where people just shy away from doing anything, but there are always great opportunities when everyone's on the sideline and fearful.
right? Yeah. Because Look at Bitcoin. you know that you can make this work with the current interest rates, with the current underwriting model, with the current price. And if your time horizon is reasonable enough, you this will absolutely come back. And we've always seen, you know, highs and lows and all that. So yeah, I can't agree more. I, I mean, look at look at Bitcoin. Um, yeah. Bitcoin, you look at the trends of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. People, when there's that fear of missing out mentality, everybody floods in and drives the price to 60,000 per Bitcoin. Well, now Bitcoin is down, you know, to 60% less than its high. Technically, that's a great opportunity because then what happens is every, there, every, every three to four years, Bitcoin starts driving. It's that popularity contest and it's going to do it again, probably. And then it's the people who know to buy yeah. when everybody's full and sell when everybody's in. True. It's just, and it's that's why having most... that, it's having that confidence to trust it because it's hard from an emotional standpoint. But then when it comes to business decisions and investment decisions, you have to try and take emotion out of it. Which is the hardest part. I mean, that's yes. why most people probably lose a lot of money is because when they go in, when the tide's rising and they, you know, get out, but that's not the time you actually go in. You When the tide's falling is when you go in and you make most to get out at the right time. But yeah, and going back to that topic of mortgages and things like that, everyone in the world right now wants to find out. And because you're in the industry, I'm compelled to ask this, is where do you see your crystal ball kind of in the whole gamut of interest rates and how far along uh, will they go up? I, I saw projections of, oh, in summer, they'll be sub fives. And some people say, oh, no, they're not going to, they're still going to hold on for a long time. Where do you see that happening? It's uh, that's that's yeah that is the crystal ball question because everybody has a different opinion. Um, mm -hmm. Personally, I think it's going to go on for probably another year, maybe mm -hmm. two years. Um, I've talked to a lot of higher up financial advisors who foresee it like the pain growing for a while because it's like there's nothing that says it's going to stop at the current. Like there's nothing. Like, yeah, at one point it has to stop. It always will. Something mm. will change, whether that's administration, whether that's who knows what, whether it's the war, whether it's all these economical factors. But currently, like today, like until until investors have more confidence, until the Fed does something to try to not to like, there's nothing that says they're going to go down ne next month or by summer, in my opinion. Mm. Um, so I personally think like, you have to be conservative and plan for the worst and then hope for the mm -hmm. best. And, and going to, if you're looking at it from an investment standpoint, you have to, you just have to focus on, okay, do I trust it? Where are the numbers at? Does it still work in the current market? If it doesn't work, how can I make it work? Um, mm -hmm. But personally, I don't foresee them coming down, especially sub five for at least a couple of years. Personally, that's my opinion. Just because I don't, I don't, I don't see what's going to, What's going to cause it? I mean, we just hit today the highest point all year of interest rates, and highest highest year highest point in the past twenty or twenty years. Yeah, uh, I'd say the last ten years, ten to fifteen years. But today we just hit a high point. Yeah, and we're so used to being in a low interest rate environment that it's hard to fathom this kind of rates too. So it's it's a lot of people don't really understand that this was not i mean this was the norm back in the day but you know we, we're not used to this so it's going to be it's going to create some heartaches pretty much i'm, I'm pretty yeah. confident uh, and that's where the like you said the opportunities will come ultimately where that's where the opportunities will land and it'll be times where if you can make these like you said numbers work and i think you'll do well over the long term and you're never going to, you're never going to time it perfect. And that's the people, you know, saying the people who try to time the, buy the lowest dip or sell the highest high, they're always the one losing because they're always chasing the, like the, the squeezing the most, but the people who win the most are, are the ones who just look at that data and try to buy when not at the top or the bottom, but somewhere near the top or the bottom and understanding like, like you're not going to squeeze every single penny into a, 
a seller into a buy. So yeah, I mean, there's just so much opportunity, but yeah, the, the, the interesting emotion behind where the interest rates were due to a crazy situation, like that's just not realistic, but you're right. Most people are basing that was, that's their new benchmark, which yeah. is mentally screwing with their minds. So this is, I mean, look at the national, the average over the last 30 years, 40 years, like that, like we're not even that far from average interest rates. So it's just understanding and rationalizing and, and that's how you should approach every single, every single business is, is rationalize, take emotion out of it and, and then make, make your decision from there. I agree a hundred percent. And, and real estate, if you th think about mortgage rates, because it affects so many people right now, I mean, we're all a factor at some point in our lives because of it be if you're a renter if you're an owner whatever you do in your life you're going to be impacted right and yeah. most people when they buy stuff it's just a lot of emotion there's no information in the decision making there's a lot of emotion oh my friend bought so i'm gonna buy you know or we're just buying in the wrong markets like you're in phoenix and it's one of the best markets in the country so if you absolutely buy right you're going to make money when you buy you're going to make money mm -hmm. when you sell so it just comes down to how much education and exposure you have and that's what it comes down to in terms of real estate being fearless i think the main thing with with business and real estate and just anything anything that you want to do the last two years you know i've witnessed people die i've witnessed um unhappiness in people mm -hmm. and like i'm last year like we've had terror i have four kids under eight like our life is pure chaos and so every pregnant we've we haven't traveled a lot in the past six years because every pregnancy that that we have is very tough um my kids are all in the nicu my second uh child was given a one percent chance of survival when his water broke at 17 weeks and, um, and so like, we've had a very tough six years while building, doing business. Right. And so the last year we were like, me and my wife, we we're like, we're going to find reasons to do stuff because especially in my business, networking with people and talking with friends, there's just so much unhappiness in this world, sadly. Mm -hmm. And and this kind of goes toward the motivation of the, the newest season of, of our podcast, Fueled by Why, is like, there's just so many people stuck and unhappy. There's so many people who aren't fulfilling, you know, what they want to do in life. They're not, they're yeah. finding reasons why not to do stuff. And, you know, like when it comes to investments, when it comes to business, mm -hmm. I'm just really have the mindset of like, I'm going to if an opportunity shows itself or if I have a thought to do something, I'm just going to lean into that, that, that thought and be fearless because I don't want, A, I don't want my, I want my kids to see that they can take risks. Um, mm -hmm. B, like I never want to look back on our life and said, I should have done that. I should have done that. Like there's so many people who, who just never take a little baby step. Yeah. My, my, my parents immigrated here from Poland and like, that was, that was the biggest leap to immigrate here from Poland when you don't even speak English. And so it's like, I use a lot of my motivation and my why to like, cause I want my kids to be fearless in things that they do. I don't want them to be unhappy and like, whatever, if you're like, you only live once. And most people I was reading an article last night interviewing somebody on their deathbed and most people on their deathbed if that you ask them like 10 questions and like what's their biggest regret most of them are is like i should have done that business i should have done this i should have bought that thing and i've lost on many things as i'm sure you have too it's like but it's like i'd rather lose than say i didn't do it and people you know you're always going to have family and friends who are the ones who are driven by fear mm -hmm. either judge you for doing it or tell you how lucky you are when you when you succeed which drives me crazy but i purely believe that like luck isn't like luck luck is around everybody but the ones who are lucky are the ones who are 
the ones who are lucky just are the ones who took the opportunity fearlessly and said and saw an opportunity and and took the risk of leaning into that opportunity because luck surrounds itself around every single person but the ones who never like take that opportunity and lean into it the luck never has an opportunity to show itself because they never lean into it so i mean being fearless on on investments and being fearless in business and finding happiness whatever that may be like uh, i just i wish i could i wish i could ingrain that in everybody that's great man it's really inspiring and you know really learning to live with intention in whatever you do yes. you know intentionally take a vacation take a break enjoy life and live without any regret so that you know anytime you can look back and be proud of what you did and i think if there's anything our listeners take away from this episode both of those are very very powerful thanks again for highlighting that and bringing that to our attention. That's a good segue. I want to talk a couple of minutes about your podcast, you know, give us a very high level overview before, you know, we go in and go on to our rapid fire questions. Uh, yeah, can for you sure. tell our listeners a little bit about your podcast and, you know, what it is about? Yeah. Um, and I can't wait to have you on this podcast, by the way. Um, but no, so I started, I started a podcast seven years ago. Um, and initially it was called Loan It and Own It. And because it was, you Love know, being, name. I know, right. Being in mortgage, I'll, I got to show you like the initial intro video is hilarious, mm -hmm. um, but being in mortgage, like obviously I needed to meet real estate agents. And so it was a, it was a mortgage and real estate podcast where I would come and interview real estate agents mm -hmm. to promote them, to meet them, to network them. Right. You got to lift up others up if you, you know, lift others up and you'll be rewarded. Um, and so just, that, I did that for a couple of years and it was, you can only talk about real estate so much, right? And so keeping hearing from realtors, I was just like, okay, kind of burnt out. I developed it into an entrepreneur podcast. So we started interviewing realtors, but also local entrepreneurs in the community. And the whole mm -hmm. theory was, you know, instead of hearing from just Fortune 500 CEOs on these, you know, how I built things uh, podcasts, let's hear from the common man. Let's hear from the small business owner. Let's hear those stories. Mm -hmm. And then um, we got really busy. Very and powerful, working. by the way. The common man yeah. story is a much better story than any story. Exactly. It's like you hear all the podcasts about the 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 Fortune 500 CEOs, and those are great. Like those are great, but the most relatable ones are are sometimes the other the smaller ones. Mm -hmm. And so then mortgage went crazy in the last three years. We kind of took a little sidestep from it, and I also was just like you know what, like after talking to entrepreneurs so much, I really just love the why story, the motivation, the life, like the life behind it, what drives them, the hustle, what, what terrible things have happened in their life that turned into good. Um, and I was just like, you know what, this isn't just an entrepreneur podcast. This is just a why in life. Like what, what, what fuels your fire and what make, because if, if somebody else may need to hear this, going back to the happiness thing, Somebody else, if they hear somebody who they can relate to, whether it's just somebody struggling with depression, whether it's somebody struggling in business, if they hear somebody else that they can relate to, like maybe that could change their life, right? So in the past couple of years, uh, we just rebanded it to fueled by why, like, because what is your fuel? What is your why? What are you fueled by? And, um, and I always did it myself and it was just time consuming. It's very hard when you have four kids under eight and you're doing business stuff. And so my best friend, Josh, who motivated me to do the podcast in 2015, he moved to Arizona. And I said, Josh, come be a co-host with me. Like, let's do it together. Let's, we haven't done this like full forward. It was always like a little side fling for me to meet people and network with people. But like, I think this could be a really cool thing and, and that like people could listen to and feel motivated and change their life and hear from real people because everybody like I was telling you, everybody has a movie, like everybody's life is a movie, but you never get to see the movie. You only see the success, you know? And it's like, absolutely. 99.999% of people, you just don't see their movie. I'm around, I'm, I'm at my friend's office right now and he's going to be a great guest, hit data driven big time. But there's five guys in this office and it's like, I don't know their life story. Like there's probably so many interesting things that happen to get them to here. And so 
Josh moved to Arizona. I said, Josh, do it. I had another friend who had been wanting to start a podcast. I said, hey, three co-hosts. How awesome that three different perspectives. And we're all different. You know, I'm very relationship and, and life and passion. Josh is more operation and perfectionist. And then you have Scott, our third co-host, who's very sales oriented. He's built sales departments. He's been VP of sales. And so we have these three different perspectives. And in the past year, we've taken this to a new level, production-wise, sponsor-wise, um, video-wise, like just everything. And like, so it's it's called Fueled by Why. And we interview everybody from, from still, you know, CEOs in Fortune 500 companies, like we'll interview those. But now a lot of ours is just like the common man, but also down to the house mom down to the pastor that is down great. to now I, I want to have a husband and wife on there. I want to have two husband and wives on there and talk about relationship. Like, cause relationships are tough. Yeah. And sometimes people just need to hear other stories to be like, okay, like we're okay. Cause everybody thinks they're, you know, they're struggling in their relationship. It's the worst thing in the world. But when they realize like it's normal, what they're going through, like that may be, make it better. And so we interview and we just talk about like, their story and their why and what motivates them and i tell people like the theory is is like if we can have one listener listen to your story and feel like they can like their motive like that changes their perspective like i can do that too then we mm -hmm. we are we are bringing some value in life so it's called feel by why um and now i have three co-hosts or two co-hosts we have three hosts together and we throw out three episodes a month and it's like, we we've turned this into a legitimate thing and it's, it is fun as I'm sure this is too. Uh, listeners to go ahead and check it out. And just by, I've listened to a few episodes. They're all great stories. Like, and to your point, very relatable, right? You're talking to a highly successful guy. Very few people can relate to it, but if you're talking to a common, you know, like a house mom or someone, the struggles that they go through, they're very relatable and they just make you a better human being, you know, from, you said, from a relationship standpoint, from kids standpoint and all of that. Congratulations on the success of the podcast and uh, very excited to kind of follow your journey uh, um, through this process. I also want to kind of jump into our rapid fire, quick questions that we typically like to ask and hopefully add value to our listeners. What's your favorite book? Ooh, um, one that I read just a long time ago that really changed my perspective on social media was uh, it's Jab, 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 Right Hook by Gary Vee. Um, oh, that was just okay. cool. It kind of changed how I went about uh, just in social media in general. It's just a kind of perspective. Anything that makes you think and question yourself, I mm -hmm. think is a good book. That's great. I, I'm a big follower of Gary Vee. Never read the book, but thank you. It's on my list. Um, any particular favorite ritual that you like to follow? Ooh, um, every night before bed with my kids. This isn't. This is more life related. Uh, we mm -hmm. have th we have four family mottos that we just they we all recite to each other, and it's um, it's Augustine are brave, strong, and powerful. That's our last name, and then like that's our family motto. We never give up practice makes perfect and we can do all things through Christ that gives us strength. And so we, those are just four things that like me and my kid, like that's my kids know that that's our family, our family motto. Great, great ritual, man. I mean, it's, you're just getting your kids in the right mindset from a very early age, you know, a great job uh, doing that. What's your personally, if there's a business key indicator in business that actually you look at and say, Hey, I think there's things are going good or things are not going good. Is there anything uh, that you look at from your business standpoint? I, uh, that one's hard. As long as to me, I don't look at the volume production because volume production closings and all that fun stuff will, will always come and go. I look at the little stuff if because i assign myself like different little tasks throughout the week to accomplish mm -hmm. and i look back on those and i say did i accomplish the little things because i know if i accomplish the little things then the big things will come thank you what inspires you on a daily basis Ooh, my kids my kids i just want i want them to see see what hard work ethic and working hard does and so i would say my kids 
and you know, for 90% of us, I think it's family that really drives us forward. Uh, yeah. Any particular online tool or a little hack or some app that you personally love a lot or you've just started using? I listen to a lot of podcasts uh, yeah. between passion stuff, business, mm -hmm. and motivation. I just listen to podcasts whenever I can take in more content and more mm -hmm. ideas. You never know. You never know what next person or next thing you listen to that makes you just go, hmm, that's cool. And so I just, anytime I can, I'm just listening to a bunch of podcasts. And, you know, you, you could get it on any platform. So thanks again. And I think that brings us to the end of the show. Andrew, it's a real pleasure. There's an all, not a lot of people that actually have inspired me through their, through the podcast uh, interview process, but this one's a very different one for me personally. And I really wanted to appreciate you taking the time, you know, coming onto our show and talking to our listeners and would at some point bring you back through this process and check and see how things are going. But thank you again for uh, coming on the show. I would love it. And uh, thank you. I appreciate it. This is awesome. Can't wait to have you on ours and uh, we'll yeah. catch up next time. All right. Thanks a lot, man. I hope everyone found a lot of value in our episode. If you have a friend, spouse, or a fellow entrepreneur who would benefit from hearing this or others in my series, please tell them. To catch the next one, I'd love for you to subscribe, like, and share my page to help get the word out. Thanks for listening. And from business to personal, remember, always mind your data. See you next time.